Ich will jetzt machen. Ähm, fangen wir jetzt sofort an. Wenn ich jetzt eben noch ähm, den Stream öffnen, weil wir die ganze Veranstaltung streamen werden. Das heißt, wenn jemand von euch nicht später dabei sein will, ähm, weil das Produkt ist, die dann Fragen gestellt werden, die nicht öffentlich aufgezeichnet werden sollen, dann, äh, was machen wir dann? Dann haben wir das schon. Jetzt zeichnen wir nochmal nach der Veranstaltung. Nachdem es live gestreamt. Richtig, weil das ein live ist. Aber man sieht bei uns im Podium was. So, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the microphone is not available like the, the others. Uh, I'm not quite alone until I pass. I, uh, I see some sorry. Uh, I'm giving them back, so we uh, needed some time uh, to set all the tech up then. Anyway, thank you a lot for your patience. Um, I'm just about to start the stream, so I can monitor the questions there coming through via the chat. So, Henning and I would welcome you to our today's podium, severely underfounded but greatly needed, conditions and challenges of anti-Semitism research. And uh, before we start, we might just introduce ourselves. So Henning, he is a research assistant and here at Goethe University in Frankfurt and PhD candidate at the University of Mainz. And Tim Stoßberg is a colleague of mine who has been organizing with me the event here. Um, he is a research assistant at the Forschungszentrum um, Globaler Islam uh, um, and writing uh, his uh, PhD about uh, Islamic anti Semitism. Going to be a PhD someday. <laughs> so, um, right. And in other words, before we start, we would like to um, thank our supporters. So, we would like to thank the Human Forum, the Deutsche Städtische Gesellschaft, the Initiative into the Sizilian Antisemitismus Forschung, TRIA, the Gesellschaft für Kritische Bildung, the Amadeo Antonio Stiftung, and the Aster der Goethe Universität Frankfurt, and auch noch ganz hinten, when the writer of the Human Forum. So, we will continue our um, evening program in English, so I hope that's fine for everyone. And I would like to start with a short introduction to the topic, and then we would like to do some guests. But, yeah. So, 84 years ago, the November pogroms marked the beginning of the systematic extermination of Germany and later the European Union. Sadly, the fight against anti-Semitism remains a central task today. However, anyone who wants to combat anti-Semitism effectively must understand it in its complexity. At the same time, research on anti-Semitism is exposed to precarious scholarship and social societal challenges that severely limit its research. What are these challenges and obstacles how can they be overcome? To answer these questions, we will welcome our guests, Professor David Hirsch and Mark Soil. Unfortunately, on your, our third guest, Anja Hesse, cannot be with us today, but she wishes us every success. So, So our first guest is uh, Professor David Hirsch from the Goldsmith College in the London Centre for Contemporary uh, for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism in London, which was uh, funded this year in September officially. Um, 
he studied sociology, philosophy, and social theory, and wrote, wrote his PhD on crimes against humanity and international law. In 2017, he published his book, Contemporary Left Antisemitism, which David, among other things, criticized the anti Semitic politics of the British Labour Party. Um, last but not least, yeah, he's the founder and the CEO of the London Centre of Sociologies. Um, which is a new and important institute in the academic landscape, especially the British one, but we will talk about that uh, later on the podium. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for being here, and uh, yeah, welcome. Oh, no, you're going to our guests, and then we go over to the to your short moments. So our second guest for today is Mark Sawyer. He's a founding member of the Initiative Interdisciplinary and Antisemitismus Forschung, the Initiative for Interdisciplinary Research and Antisemitism at the University of Turia. He's currently studying political science and intercultural gender studies in the master's program at Turia University. And his research focuses on the theory and history of ideas of anti-Semitism, social theory and criticism inspired by the critical theory, and anti-Semitism in political parties and movements. So thank you for coming today. And we would like to start with um, yeah, our two, the two short contributions of you both. And then we will um, continue with an open discussion to which we would like to invite you very much as well. We would like to introduce you as well, so you can um, be free to ask questions and also for the shop chat online we will answer the questions from the online chat as well. So I will hand over the word to you, David. I, um Thank you very, very much uh, for inviting me. So, I want to say a few things about what we might call um, the hostile environment in academia today, uh, relating to both, I think, the study of anti-Semitism and to a critical engagement with scholarship which is anti-Semitic. So I think they're two slightly different tasks that we have, uh, but I think they're both important, and I think there is a hostile environment uh, in general to both of those things. Um, the In Britain, um, I won't tell the whole story, but it, there was established in the uh, very early years of the 21st century, um, a principle called the Macpherson Principle, uh, by which people who say that they have experienced racism should be uh, at least um, uh, treated with an assumption that they speak in good faith. So if somebody says, for example, to a police officer, I was a victim of a racist attack, then the, everybody knows, including the police, because the police are trained in this way now, that the police should begin by assuming that the uh, person who reports that experience is speaking in good faith, and they should assume, they should begin by assuming it's true. That doesn't mean that anyone who says that they've been the victim of a racist attack uh, is necessarily telling the truth. It just means that there's a, a way of proceeding now which is an assumption of good faith. And I think that uh, that assumption of good faith has been also hard won, uh, and not completely won, but hard won, uh, for example, for women, uh, who, if they report uh, uh, sexual violence or harassment, uh, the principle is well understood that they should anyway, uh, any investigation should begin with the assumption that they are telling the truth and with the assumption that they are speaking in good faith. And I don't think that that 
uh, assumption, I don't think, that the McPherson principle operates uh, for Jews. I think that if Jews report having experienced certain kinds of anti-Semitism, then uh, there is a widespread assumption that they are not speaking in good faith. And specifically the kind of anti-Semitism that particularly uh, is um, affected in that way is anti-Semitism that comes in a language related to uh, criticism of Israel or to hostility to Israel, in fact. So if uh, somebody says uh, that they experienced anti-Semitism, uh, for example, in a debate about uh, whether Israelis, Israeli colleagues should be prohibited from coming onto this campus, or should be not invited to this campus, or should be not allowed into our journals to publish, or should be not allowed into our conferences, in other words, a boycott of Israeli universities. If I report uh, having experienced anti-Semitism within such a debate, then uh, there is a widespread assumption that my uh, report is made in bad faith. Uh, I noticed this phenomenon some years ago, uh, actually uh, when Ken Livingston was still the mayor of London, <laughs> and I gave it a name, uh, which I put the Livingston formulation. And uh, what happened with Ken Livingston was that he was accused of anti-Semitism um, actually nothing to do with Israel and Palestine uh, because he had uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter why he was accused but it was a kind of perfectly reasonable accusation actually in the context and his response was not to relate to the charge that was made or to relate to what he said that is said to be anti-Semitic but his response instead was to say uh, far too often uh, uh, I am accused of anti-Semitism because I am critical of the policies of the Israeli government. And then you think, well, how come, you know, actually this incident was nothing to do with the Israeli government, but uh, uh, quite a lot of Ken anti-Semitism is to do with not the Israeli government, but with Israel itself. Uh, how does it follow? And of course, if you think it through, what's happening is that there is an allegation of bad faith. And notice the Livingston formulation doesn't say uh, Jews who raise the issue of anti-Semitism uh, are a little paranoid. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they, because of their experiences, uh, they see anti-Semitism sometimes where it is, or it doesn't say that they're mistaken. It says that they speak in bad faith, that they are lying and that they're lying for a reason. And the reason is so that people will be stopped from being critical of Israel because they will be afraid of being accused of anti-Semitism even for entirely rational and legitimate criticisms uh, that they may wish to make or for uh, um, defending Palestinian rights. So the McPherson principle does not operate for Jews, particularly in left-wing and liberal environments, uh, which certainly includes um, universities in general, and certainly includes the British Labour Party in general, uh, because in those contexts, Ken Livingston doesn't say, begin by taking the experience of Jews in good faith, he says, begin by assuming that the Jews are up to something when they talk about anti-Semitism. Begin by assuming that what they're really trying to do is to silence criticism of Israel. Now actually the third part of that story is that there was a report by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission in Britain into Labour anti-Semitism in the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn and it reported precisely this that one of the forms that unlawful harassment of Jews took in the Labour Party while, while uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was the leader was this uh, kind of indiscriminate 
accusation that um, uh, that accusation that talk about anti-Semitism is fake or is a smear. Actually, if you think it through, the word smear is odd because a smear needs to have something there to smear, right? If you smear something on a window, you start with something. Or, or <laughs> weaponization, right? If you weaponize anti-Semitism, then actually there is something there already. But uh, don't think too carefully. Just understand that the accusation is that there's nothing significant there, and uh, the people who raise the issue of anti-Semitism are taking something into and smearing it across the whole window, or across the whole person, or uh, they are uh, taking something into significance and creating out of it a weapon through dishonesty. So that practice of anti-Zionism is a practice of accusing Jews of dishonesty and actually of conspiracy. Because nobody, uh, it's not as if this has only ever been done by one person. Right? Every time we raise the issue of anti-Semitism, we're accused in response uh, of uh, uh, trying to do so for an ulterior motive. And if we're all lying, then we must be lying together. <laughs> we're not just mistaken. And if you look at the critique of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, you'll see that that's precisely what is alleged. It's not alleged that uh, IRA was just a kind of mistake or that IRA should have been drafted more carefully. What is alleged is that IRA is a kind of Zionist conspiracy to, uh, to say that things are anti-Semitic that, that they know full well are not anti-Semitic. And uh, it's driven by the State of Israel and by the Zionists and by the Trumpists and by the Tories in Britain, and uh, we should protect our campuses from that illegitimate attempt to close down free speech. Now, Ira doesn't do any of that. Ira says that there is anti-Zionist anti-Semitism, it says that it's significant, and it says that generally it looks like this and this and this and this and this, it gives some examples of how it generally appears, and then it warns you, it says don't imagine that you can make a judgment outside of context, so in order to make a judgment about what is anti-Semitic you have to look at the context. In other words, Ira doesn't say anything is anti-Semitic, Ira gives you a framework by which you can make judgments according to context, and then Ira warns you further Criticism of Israel, like criticism of any other state, is not anti-Semitic. I mean, actually, that's not true, because sometimes it can be, but let's not go there, because the truth about IRA is that it's a very tame document. Very tame. It doesn't really say anything is anti-Semitic. All it does is affirm that this kind of anti-Semitism exists, and you should take it seriously. And it says nothing at all about what follows. So if you determine, let me give you a story. Um, there was a, um, an academic who said a whole number of anti-Semitic things, and this happened more than once actually. And a Jewish student takes a, a, a complaint about this anti-Semitic discourse to the university. The university takes months and months and months and it hires an expensive lawyer to, to do the report and the lawyer comes back and says there was no unlawful speech. And the Jewish student says, well hang on, <laughs> well he doesn't because generally he's too busy prowling, but hang on, I didn't say there was unlawful speech, I said there was anti-Semitic speech. And the university re replies again, there was no unlawful speech. The universities refuse to determine whether this or that speech is anti-Semitic or not. And I think actually it's time to demand that universities separate the question of whether something is anti-Semitic from the question of whether, of, of what follows. You know, 
if you show that speech was anti-Semitic, does that mean that there's a disciplinary case? Well, perhaps not necessarily. Perhaps a university could come back and say, this is anti-Semitic, but it's protected free speech also. If that's what they want to say, let them say it. Let them be open and honest. And then we can have a discussion about their duty of care to their Jewish students and their duty of care to their non-Jewish students. And we can have a discussion about the discourse that was judged too rightly to be anti-Semitic, um, which is also said to be acceptable within the rules of academic freedom. And by the way, the rules of what is appropriate in a scholarly community are not the same as the rules of what is appropriate in a public square or online, right? Unlawful speech is a very low bar. Because there's nothing unlawful, in Britain anyway, about being a racist, right? There's plenty of racists in Britain, they don't get taken off to prison, and plenty of racists say racist things, and they still don't get taken off to prison, because there are laws about incitement and, and other specifics. Of course, hate speech laws are different in different countries, but uh, the, the requirement of scholarship not the same as the requirement of the public square. Anyway, let me move on. Um, yeah, there's a couple of stories I wanted to tell actually. One is that uh, I tweeted uh, a few months ago now. I tweeted that um, I tweeted about the campaign which is called decolonizing the curriculum. I don't know if people have heard of it or if you have an equivalent here in Germany. But uh, in Britain, there is a campaign which is sanctioned by the official authorities in the university, in my university anyway, which is called Decolonizing the Curriculum. And uh, the idea is that people go through all of our course outlines and all of the things that we teach and also our research, and they look at how many um, authors are. Uh, white and how many are not white and how many uh, embrace a decolonial uh, politics or intellectual framework and how many don't. And uh, the idea of decolonizing is that we take the colonial authors out. Now, of course, much depends on how this policy <coughs> would ever be implemented. But there is talk of you know, teams of postgrad students going through your reading list and saying no, 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 yes, no, um, and also of uh, uh, prohibiting the, the quotes uh, old white men, by which they mean, you know, the key philosophers of modernity, Descartes, Kant, Rousseau, uh, Durkheim, <laughs> Marx, hang on a sec, Durkheim and Marx are, are white, uh, those nice Jewish boys, um, <laughs> certainly they are white, according to the logic of decol. Anyway, so I, it's clear that once you have the idea that, uh, that Zionism is a form of colonialism, in its essence, that Zionism is necessarily colonialism, then decolonization takes on a different meaning, because decolonization surely means take out the Zionists from the curriculum. And who knows what that means? I have no idea what that might mean because of course all of this kind of thing requires uh, people to say, well, this is Zionist and this is not Zionist, but the people they're not going to ask are the Zionists, right? Somebody, some people are going to make a determination about what constitutes Zionism and what doesn't. So should we take Albert Einstein out of the physics curriculum he was, was he not a Zionist? Or Hannah Arendt? Well, no, Hannah Arendt was not a Zionist, an anti-Zionist, she was a Zionist, I don't know. We could talk that one through all evening, but this isn't the kind of context in which things are talked through all evening. <laughs> um, so, what I tweeted was there is an anti-Semitic edge to campaigns of decolonization of the curriculum, and the response came back President of our students union, the woman who uh, is elected to speak on behalf of all of my students, which said David Hirsch is a far right white 
two promises. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought that students union, you know, so. And um, sometime later, um, so actually, I wasn't that interested in going after the students, and I said, people said, well, you should sue them for libel, and I said, of course, you don't sue your own students. <laughs> but I was interested in, <laughs> do we? And I was, in, the number of people who said I should, I was interested in holding the institution to account, right? Because I wanted to say to the institution, you have a, an institutional culture in which the elected representatives of your students are able to come to the the, the leading, actually, really the only scholar of contemporary anti-Semitism in the whole university, who is Jewish, who is of Jewish descent, whose mother came from Germany in 1938, and to say he's a far, a far right white supremacist. And I said that I hear, <coughs> when you say far right white supremacist, I hear Nazi, right? You're calling me a Nazi. And actually, some of us supporters said, no, 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 I'm not a Nazi. <laughs> So, and then my own union branch, uh, because so because I had gone to the administration and made a fuss, they went to speak to the student union and made a little fuss, and then she tweeted again and she said, I'm being witch hunted by uh, the institution uh, according to the neoliberal education agenda. Uh, these people are making cuts and putting, making people redundant, and in particular making redundant anyone who teaches interesting and radical things, and now they're accusing me of anti-Semitism because I'm critical of Israel. And then my union branch went and endorsed it and offered full solidarity to the student union president. So not only was uh, uh, the woman elected to speak for my students uh, calling me that, but also the people elected by me and my colleagues uh, to speak for us also. And then it was a very strange situation because I've been there for, I don't know, 17, 18 years, and I've usually kept pretty quiet, actually, since I got slapped around intellectually many years ago. I've been pretty quiet in my own campus. But here I said, I just wrote a, a thing on the departmental WhatsApp group, and I said, this is not okay. And everyone said, no, this is not okay. This is this is back, this is not okay, we'll fix it. So the department reps went back to the union branch and they made my case, <laughs> uh, which was kind of extraordinary, and uh, they lost. And I kind of said, well, why, you know, why are you making my case now? Because you know me, because you know I'm not a Nazi, but it's not the, not the kind of principle, and they said, no, no, we're going to get this fixed. Wasn't fixed. And then uh, the people in my department said, uh, okay, well, we'll put out a statement. Well, first we'll write to the union executive, then we'll put out a statement. I said, you need to say that your colleague, David Hirsch, is not an answer. Right? Not that difficult. It was difficult, because they could not draft a statement to say David Hirsch is not an answer that they could all sign. And of course I said, well, if it's not unanimous, it doesn't... If it's not unanimous, then what you're doing is you're listing the people who are unable to sign a statement which says David Hirsch not an Nazi, right? I could go on, I could go on with any number of stories <coughs> anti-Semitism, and I think this might even be a kind of universal truth about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is about taking people who thought that they were at home in a particular place or a space and saying, you're not at home. And I remember 18 years ago, I remember sitting around my departmental meeting thinking, wow, I'm one of these people. And being quite proud that I was sitting with all these professors and, 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 and others. And um, then when I started writing about in opposition to the boycott of Israel and then in opposition to anti-Semitism, it was made very clear to me that I was no longer one of these people. That I was no longer a sociologist, that I was now a Zionist sociologist, which means a dishonest, lying, racist, uh, right, white supremacist sociologist. In other words, somebody who uses the rhetorics of sociology in bad faith in order to help the racist oppression of Palestinians. That's who I became. 
and uh, that's the hostile environment. And that's the environment in which we try to get published, in which we try to teach, in which we try to get research funding, in which we try to get uh, to be part of an ordinary scholarly community, in which we sit around at lunchtime once a week and talk about our work. But none of that is possible. None of that is possible when you are defined in, in the way that a quote Zionist gets defined. And of course, Zionism in this context is not self-defined, right? It's not because I defined myself as a Zionist. In fact, I never really did. I was quite shy about doing that. And if people would ask me, I would say, it doesn't matter, actually. So I've been an expert witness sometimes in a courtroom about anti-Zionism. And the judge will kind of look at it and he'll say, well, what is really, what really is Zionism? And I'll mess with it, really, and I'll say, look, I'm a sociologist, so I can't tell you what really it is, but I can tell you the way in which it's used. And the way that the word Zionism is used by anti-Zionism is as, that it means racist, it means bad person, it means the worst kind of person. The worst kind of person imaginable, really, is a racist. That's what Zionism means in this context, and that's why I don't write anti-Zionism with a hyphen anymore, for the same reason we don't write anti-Semitism with a hyphen, because the Semitism of anti-Semitism is invented by the anti-Semite, and the Zionism invented by the anti-Zionist is invented by the anti-Zionist. So, let me say three more things. Firstly, in May 2021, when there was a conflict uh, in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, uh, I don't know if people remember or if people in Germany really noticed, but there were uh, what I think amounted to loyalty pledges circulating all around that deal. And very straightforwardly, there were statements, they were either elaborate or they were simple, some of them were a simple tweet, and they said, Israel is apartheid, and it is colonial, and it is illegitimate, and it must be boycotted. And these principles are foundational to our scholarship and to our morality. Now, I would imagine most people were able to kind of sign it and repeat it and send it on, actually, you know, kind of thoughtlessly and kind of innocently, really. People thought, oh my gosh, there's something terrible going on. Israel is attacking and killing Palestinians for no reason, and I should sign a statement in defense of the Palestinians. So they signed it and they passed it on and they didn't really think about it anymore. But Jewish people, looked at it and they said, well, hang on, <laughs> hang on, I don't really agree with this, or, you know, I might have my own quite complex, nuanced critique of Israel, or of this that Israel does, or that that Israel does, but I'm not going to uh, jump through the hoop given to me by anti-Zionism, right? Israel is a apartheid. Well, it's a little bit, it's not a little bit, it might become, there are some Israelis, Whatever might be my newest position, I know that if I sign up to this, then I'm saying that Israel is, that Israel, Israel is the racist state, and anyone who supports it is a racist. So I don't want to sign it. But then I see that, it, that this principle is foundational to my scholarship. Right? If I do not sign it, I have no foundation to my scholarship any longer. My scholarship is not scholarship anymore, and my morality is not moral anymore. At least, I'm not a scholar and I'm not a moral person, which kind of means I'm not a person, I suspect. So, something that people might have signed very easily and just passed on, is not easy for me. <laughs> um, and it was, by the way, endorsed by uh, a whole number, for example, of uh, women's studies departments, and uh, 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 not just individuals, but departments and um, Collectivities, which would have included, which would have included people who would have felt quite messed by that, and actually specifically would have felt 
that they were made not at home by that any longer. And probably, who wouldn't have had the courage or the knowledge to say so either, would have just kept quiet. Um, so those, and those volunteer tests were all over the place and they were circulating in Princeton, Harvard, and in England, and in Cambridge, and all over the place. Um, with, with no really critical uh, response. And by the way, no critical response from the organized networks of Jewish studies, or from the Anti-Semitism Center in London, I suspect from the Anti-Semitism Center in Berlin, although some people correct me if that's wrong. And uh, indeed, <laughs> Jewish studies itself had quite a big and long debate about whether it should endorse this uh, uh, statement, and I think it did endorse a statement that was functionally similar, but was a little bit more carefully drafted. And of course, Jewish studies, uh, in general, has uh, endorsed the uh, attempts to delegitimize IRA as a Trumpist Zionist Israeli plot to close down the free speech. It's as though the Jewish studies scholars are, are, are kind of going to make a deal and saying to the Antisemites, if we endorse, if we, if we, if we affirm that you're not anti-Semitic, will you then let us stay? Right? Will you then let us do our thing and, and will you leave us alone? And of course the answer is no, no they won't. <laughs> or at least some of them won't. Um, because people like uh, uh, David Miller and other uh, on that kind of radical wing of nationalism will say absolutely not. Uh, you are still Zionist, in fact. Um, so what do we do? Um, we're trying to build a, an institution uh, by which we can organize resistance to the hostile environment and by which we can organize an environment that is not hostile. We had a conference, um, our inaugural conference in September, and I think it was quite successful. Some of the people in this room were there. And a number of the people who were there were quite emotional, actually, and they were quite emotional. They came to me, one post-grad student in particular came to me and, and she said, oh my gosh, that came out of the session, oh my god, it was amazing because we gave our papers and nobody denounced us. Mm -hmm. Nobody said we were, you know, <laughs> racist, imperialist, blah, blah, blah. They, that wasn't there. And we were actually able to have a really proper discussion about our papers. And she, not even knowing the kind of significance of what she said and what she was feeling, uh, because to my mind what she was saying was that perhaps she wasn't even quite aware of how hostile the environment was until she was in an environment that was not hostile. And then it's kind of illuminated by the shadow but um, when it's not there, it feels like a kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, something amazing, something to feel emotional about. And it wasn't just her, a number of people at that conference said the same thing to me. And of course it's not unique to us, but it does tell you something, I think, about the hostile environment, because a lot of scholars of anti-Semitism feel isolated. They, 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 or not even scholars, of course, students too, and the stories I personally aware of of students having their essays mailed because they didn't uh, uh, parrot the anti-Zionist truths. Uh, I would be here a long time. Um, and yesterday in Berlin, actually, a student came up to me and she, she said, with the same, the same kind of like, uh, idiot, idiotic euphoria, right? She kind of said, wow, the things you said really, really made sense to me and really helped me and made me feel I'm not alone. And I said, oh, well, brilliant, you, you've read my book. She said, no, I just heard you speak. <laughs> and that was it. And um, so there are lots of people who think they're alone, who think that they are not really scholars, because you internalize this stuff, right? This is one of the things that the hostile environment does, is it internalizes the feeling that you're not really a proper scholar, that you're not really 
embedded in scholarship, that you're not really very good, that you don't, how do you know when you get refused publication, whether it's because you didn't do enough work or because you're not very good or because, and of course, by the way, that's something that is common to all racism and sexism and the rest of it, that, that, that we internalize the kind of scolding that we get from the hospital in so we are building a structure because without a structure we're kind of lost um, and things are getting harder and harder and there are not many of us left. Uh, some of us have retired and got old and died and some of us are young and cannot get jobs and cannot get into the academy uh, and some of us uh, earn their living in the universities doing work that is kosher and then doing kind of anti-Semitism work, uh, you know, on the side uh, because, because they already have a chair doing something else. And there are very, very few professional scholars of anti-Semitism teaching and researching successfully, at least in Britain. I think there are, I certainly know of some in Germany, but uh, I think that, that it's very difficult here too. Um, so we, as I said, there's sort of two elements. One is to study anti-Semitism and the other is to engage with anti-Semitic scholarship, which is very, very important. So when people have an anti-Semitic version of <coughs> anti-colonialism or of intersectionality or of uh, uh, genocide studies or of critical theory or of Marxism or of, or of, you know, or of actually cultural studies, there are anti-Semitic versions of all of this stuff. And we need to be able to recognize it and to engage with it. So, this requires funding. I kind of feel this room is a metaphor, right? There's a few of us stuck at the front of the room, but there needs to be 500 people in this room ready and, and willing and knowing how to begin to change the way people are thinking. It's a nice room. I like this room. I like the bloody microphone. <laughs> but there must be hundreds of people online, right, I think. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I'm not being rude to my hosts, right, at all. I'm saying that this is, uh, uh, this is the problem that, that we're dealing with. So, um, we need to create an infrastructure. We need to create the infrastructures of publishing. So we are working on a book series for the London Centre um, with Routledge, and we need journals where people can be peer reviewed actually by their peers and not by their enemies. And we are nurturing the, the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism, and we need more policy orientated work that can be given to policy makers and can begin to make a difference, and we need more journalistic stuff that can help people who are being attacked by this kind of anti-Semitism to defend themselves and we need blogs and we need uh, a social media presence and we need uh, a YouTube channel and we need podcasts and we're trying to build and to nurture and to maintain that kind of structure, infrastructure uh, of academia. Uh, we also need proper funding in order to finance proper research, right? I know of Gosh, I bet you, if you gave me 10 minutes, I could name you 10 young scholars who should be financed to write the book that is inside them, and they would be 10 brilliant books, right? But the way that research happens is that somebody pays for it, because it's not a sort of gentleman <coughs> amateur business, right? It's not cricket, <laughs> it's research. So we need funding and we need, so we need to create alternative funding sources and funding streams. Uh, we need um, conferences, we need events, we need online events, we need real life events, and we need to uh, uh, bring such uh, institutions and such networks together to create a space where we can do proper, proper scholarly discussion and writing and reading and peer review, where we can do what we need to do in an environment that is not hostile. 
Thank you. 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 about the challenges as well, maybe, but more from a German context. So it's, I guess it will, it will be quite interesting to see maybe are there differences, are there similarities between the United Kingdom and Germany. So, thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, good evening from my side as well. Um, first of all, I want to thank Henning and Tim for organizing today's event. And I also want to thank the sponsors and the cooperation partners opportunity to join in this discussion uh, <coughs> And I would also like to, uh, to wish Ronja, who I suppose is watching the live stream, uh, a very speedy um, As David has already commented on the concrete political challenges and potential academic objections to this such as maybe the attempt to disconnect anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism, for example, in the Jerusalem Declaration on anti-Semitism, um, which is not only a problem in the UK and the unfortunately, but also in Germany. Um, but what I want to add is a different perspective, the perspective of early career anti-Semitism researchers. And what I want to describe are the experiences we have made in the Trier, the Initiative for Interdisciplinary Anti-Semitism Forschung, the Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism. Um, what is the experiences we've made as a group of early career anti-Semitism researchers trying to establish an institution, uh, the kind of institution that uh, David sketched out, the kind of infrastructure that is needed uh, in Trier. And while ours is, as far as I'm aware, um, the only such project in Germany, uh, which comes with unique and distinct challenges, um, I will also try to comment on the predicament of early career and anti-Semitism researchers in Germany more generally, and uh, try to give an impression of some of the difficulties these young scholars face, which we have come to know talks, conferences, and events um, in the last a couple of years where we organized uh, three, three conferences for especially for early career uh, researchers. So let me start by briefly introducing our initiative, uh, the idea behind it, and uh, for me a short history so far, as I had everyone here uh, watching the live stream already know us. Um, so in, in 2019, we started from the observation that early career enters researchers in Germany currently have, have hardly any opportunities to present their often very interesting and innovative research uh, approaches and results to such audience. Uh, also, these new approaches either do not reach the civil society actors that engage in education, prevention, and comedy with anti-Semitism, or if they do, usually only for quite a long delay. So our first project therefore was to organize a conference specifically aimed at early career researchers um, researching anti-Semitism, and to offer them a platform for presenting and discussing their research uh, the results, and just as crucial to give them the network of opportunities as David also uh, mentioned. But the fact that this was already an immediate success uh, illustrate exactly this need, that it was um, exactly this kind of event that brought together a new generation of anti-Semitism research, researchers in Germany that was missing in German context. Not um, David also said, and I would agree, PhD students and early career researchers are often on their own. They are isolated, there are different universities, and there is a lack of infrastructure, and under specific conditions in the scientific community in Germany at the moment, that is, for example, chain fixed no contracts, factorization of the academic middle bow. Um, research projects tend to devote themselves to very detailed case studies, um, but sometimes beyond these specific objects, research is lost as the academic system demands stay on track, publish as much as possible. If there are opportunities to publish, that is a difficult thing to do. Um, but sometimes this view uh, of the whole situation gets lost. But so the big questions, for example, what are the societal conditions? Under which uh, anti Semitism is reproduced constantly, that kind of question also often uh, cannot be considered in these circumstances, even though a lot of people would like to do that, like in projects, for example. So, 
what I would call critical anti-Semitism research that is dedicated to actively abolishing anti-Semitic research has a hard time with the current research landscape as it goes, as it goes against the logic of neoliberal academia. Necessary groundwork research that attempts to shed light on the complex relationship between anti-Semitism and societal, societal structures that uh, bring it up again and again is subordinated in the competition for the middle for third-party funding to projects that follow these imperatives of neoliberal academia, that is, short-run projects with ideally easily measurable impact, but that doesn't really work in anti-Semitism space all the time. It is true that politics and thus the funding landscape it subsidizes seems to have developed a heightened awareness of the necessity and urgency of research in anti-Semitism, like the various incidents of anti-Semitic violence in recent years, which initially seems to be a continuous starting point for building research at the moment. However, what we have observed um, is that the focus of funding is hardly on projects that deal with research and uncomfortable, often polarizing aspects of anti-Semitism. In the specific German post-national socialist, but also now post-migrant conservation. In the context of the increasingly visible potential of extreme right-wing attitudes in Germany in recent years, which among other things include the externalizing narrative of so-called imported anti-Semitism, uh, we are observing a trend that funding institutions are reluctant to take a scientific approach, a scientific approach to anti-Semitism in marginal aspects, for example. Within the funding context that we are familiar with, projects that address anti-Semitism from the right receive significantly more and easier support and thus funding than those that seek to address these indeed complex relationships and interplays um, of discrimination experiences, but also anti-Semitism and migrant communities. And we suspect, and this is the same with all sorts of um, areas of anti-Semitism that are not easily condemned by mainstream society. And we suspect that this circumstance is at least indirectly related to the political accountability of the funding institutions for the projects they are funded. The result is a funding focus on projects that address concerns that are as politically, politically uncontroversial as possible in mainstream society, such as the fight against the Nazi institutions. But more controversial issues, which may be associated with conflicts, but which are also equally crucial to the fight against anti Semitism, are also often ignored in this context. What may serve as a counterpoint to this current situation is the widespread opposition to the conspirational and anti Semitic movements in the moment such as Bedding, which have alarmed politicians and public officials previously unconvinced of the urgent necessity of anti Semitism. And this would probably come with new funding opportunities and also possibilities for early career researchers. But this dependence of what is on the one hand a moment of possibility of anti Semitism research. Researchers directly points to the deeper problem, I believe. That is the dependence of anti Semitism research on political cycles and the interests of third party funders. This problem of issue savings, that is the question, is anti Semitism seen as a problem by the society mainstream at a given time? That is, uh, well, these, conditions, these conditions can never be appropriate to the real and constant danger that anti Semitism poses to Jews. Talk of anti Semitism that is on the rise again, heard so often in the speeches of political leaders at the moment, uh, acutely points this out. The Jewish anti Semitism is not a new phenomenon, it is not on the rise again, it was always there. And it is not only dangerous when the societal, when, when the societal mainstream sees it as dangerous, it is not only an issue when the perpetrators are of the right kind, usually Nazis, right wing people. Uh, or also uh, you know, conspiracy theorists. Um, it's not only an issue of left or of migrants or Muslims, as some liberal and conservative commentators have seen in the community. It is not only found on the so called fringes of society, which many people would like to believe. As an ideology of pseudo rebellion against capitalist modernity, and does not as a to be born in society. And anti Semitism research must mirror this phenomenon. It has to take a wide reaching interdisciplinary approach and it has to reject the ingenuine political finger pointing and anti Semitism of the political opponent and confront the instrumentalization with the principles that has against every, every form of anti Semitism. Now, this can only be done 
by uh, institutions with long-term funding. So the funding adequately funded and crucially sufficiently motivated to do that. <coughs> Indeed, there is no shortage of extremely capable and motivated anti-Semitism researchers. As we've come to learn at our conferences, lecture series, and various other events, um, that is not the problem. The problem is, in the end, that it is an issue of funding, an issue of political will. Now to come to a few cautiously optimistic notes in the general context. As I just said, there is absolutely no shortage of capable people in anti-Semitism research, and also sufficiently motivated people in that research. And interestingly, and from our point of view, rightly so, interdisciplinary approaches are uh, again in importance, and in the self-critical questioning of academic disciplines, examining anti-Semitism in their own academic tradition, is undertaken more often uh, nowadays. For example, there have recently been a new research project, project on anti-Semitism in the judicial system, but also on anti-Semitism and German philosophy. But these are steps on the road towards establishing anti-Semitism in academic culture, which is so much. From our point of view, however, and this is reflected back to us by the many early career anti-Semitism researchers we have spoken to in the last few years, there is nonetheless a lack of institutionalized anti-Semitism research in the German landscape. Beyond these small research projects, of only a couple of years with a very specific fo focus most of the time, uh, which are of course absolutely important uh, in their own right, and for our point of view, they need not be any competition uh, between institutionalized uh, forms and project uh, research on anti-Semitism. But there needs to be, there's a need for permanent research institutions that have the institutional and personal resources for independent ground research on the one hand, but also to act as a focal point for the entire field of anti-Semitism research in Germany, because only permanent institutions are actually capable of doing that. As David pointed out, there needs to be funding infrastructure, there need to be journals, to be all sorts of publication mechanisms in place for people who are actually doing that research. That is likely at the moment. So the situation of anti-Semitism research in Germany that I've sketched out is really not a, not a promising future. <laughs> and from of these funding problems come the political attacks levied from various sides. David has sketched out, we'll check what's in there in Germany. Uh, so the question indeed is what way forward for the kind of critical anti-Semitism research that I've, whose agenda I've attacked. And uh, that's the kind of question I'm looking forward to debating with you. For the opportunity. Yeah, uh, thanks to two of you as well for your great input. Um, let me just uh, dive right into it. Um, so I was wondering, uh, speaking speaking now as a scholar, especially as an early career researcher, um, is a difficult, if not uh, even dangerous, path to walk on. Uh, as the two of you have just pointed out, really. Um, so I was wondering, how can we engage with an anti-Semitic scholarship, uh, David mentioned, when the academia really is uh, down to its core, anti-Semitic, or to say more friendly, at least friendly ignorance uh, of, uh, of it as a problem. So what the two of you would, would think, how could we actually publicly engage uh, these kind of issues. Because, uh, just, to, just to add, uh, the difficult path to walk there is we are threatened, we are offended, uh, we are threatened to lose our jobs, uh, we might be disciplined by our bosses. So, it's a, it's a hostile environment, really, as you sketched out. Uh, well, for sure. I mean, there's no easy answer. Um, the answer is find ways to publish, to do your work and find places to publish it. And even if they're not the right places, we find our own places. And, uh, you know, one can publish online, one can publish in all kinds of ways. Uh, and one can get the work out there 
And this doesn't answer the question about how you put your CV in a place where you can then get an academic job, but it does answer the question about doing the research and publishing um, what we know. Um, I'm not sure that, and that <coughs> academia is anti-Semitic to its very core. That's, it's not quite how I would articulate it. I would say that there are spaces in academia that, that embrace anti-Semitism in a whole number of different ways. Uh, probably not the majority, actually. But the problem then is that those spaces and places and disciplines and sub-disciplines are legitimized and protected by the rest. So, uh, meaning by the majority of scholars who do not speak out, who maybe do not understand and anyway know uh, very well that they shouldn't speak out because it will give them trouble, and also by um, uh, people in power, administrators, uh, you know, vice chancellors, wardens, presidents, whatever, uh, who also uh, defend the space uh, where people can do anti scholarship and call that academic freedom. Um, so it, it's a kind of institutional anti-Semitism which doesn't require us to show that, uh, uh, you know, everybody in academia is, is anti-Semitic. Um, so what I believe is at the core of the problem is the isolation of all of these early career researchers, or indeed you know, older anti-Semitism researchers who are not there, who want to speak up, but who are at different levels of universities, there's really not much of a network in Germany especially. Um, so this isolation is a big problem because what we need are concerted efforts, bringing people together who have that community who want to speak out. And so networking is incredibly important, I think. Bringing people together to actually um, act, in, uh, act together as a group. Uh, because, yeah, if you're an anti semitism researcher at a, at a department where you're alone, where you work for the, where you work, uh, where, where the, uh, the chief of the department, uh, is maybe not, not your friend. Uh, so that's, that's when it becomes important to, to uh, find allies, um, academic allies, uh, and bring together the kind of people that, that want to do something. But um, I think there is, um, the hand in the the German complex, we know all sorts of people who are willing to do that, and that's why um, kind of networks are now um, being founded at the moment. And I think that um, this new generation of researchers is quite aware of the problem, is quite aware of the fact that as individual researchers, we will not have that impact to have as a group, as a concerted effort that we could have. But I think that that's, that's a promising thing. So you described the hostile environment that um, researchers of anti-Semitism are facing. And I don't know, maybe some of you know, so David, your institute is not the only institute of other research in anti-Semitism, right? So there is also this Beerbeck Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism at mm -hmm. the same university as you are. But it's, I don't know, it might be a conflict that Sounds similar to the German conflict <laughs> with the Central for Antisemitismus Forschung, but I'm not sure. I read some parts about that. The professor David Feldman, who's leading the institute, has some very, or he, he, actually, she, he actually defended Corbyn's antisemitism argument kind of way. So, could you explain? What's the conflict with this institute? What's the context of London? Um, I'm not sure that that last bit was quite right. I, I don't think I would say that we've defended Corbyn. Uh, the problem with the uh, anti-Semitism Institute at Birkbeck in the first place was that uh, the director always said that he wanted a place where everybody can come to debate, where everybody is welcome. And what that meant in the way that he implemented it was that uh, he wanted a kind of... Kind, I'm, I'm hesitating whether it's a Jewish space, but anyway a space where people who were interested in anti-Semitism 
who were interested in opposing it or who weren't actually embracing it and who were actually practicing it could all get together and talk. Um, and that's what he did. He set up kind of endless debates between uh, people who embraced anti Semitic uh, ways of thinking and people who opposed them. And this was not a, the kind of scholarly environment that we needed within which we could do scholarship. This was not the kind of scholarly environment that created an infrastructure uh, that could do what needs to be done. This was a scholarly environment that actually um, assimilated to the environment around it. And as Hannah Arendt said, to assimilate in a time of anti-Semitism is to assimilate to anti-Semitism. That's quite a harsh proposal. But in some ways, that is the story of Jewish studies and of anti-Semitism anti, anti studies. Uh, the um, director of the Birkbeck Institute was appointed by Jeremy Corbyn to be the uh, deputy chair of an inquiry into Labour anti-Semitism in 2016. And uh, he began to do a little bit of research and then the chair herself was uh, appointed, who was uh, Tammy Chakrabarti, who um, basically elbowed him out of the way and said, don't you worry your little head about this, I'm going to do this. And she did it, and she wrote a report that missed the point, that missed every point, that did not ask for uh, submissions from people who had experienced that sentence in the Labour Party. And she wrote a report that functionally whitewashed Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, the deputy chair, who had been held over side, stayed quiet. Uh, that was a problem. And more recently, the uh, Birkbeck Centre has uh, uh, kind of led the, um, at least the Jewish opposition to IRA, um, and has been part of uh, creating um, a document which position which tries to position itself as a kind of alternative definition but which in reality is a is a uh, part of the critique of IRA and in reality is part of the uh, infrastructure that accuses IRA of being a sort of Trumpist Zionist uh, conspiracy to close down free criticism. So those <laughs> things um, uh, convinced me that we needed to uh, do something else. We needed to create an anti semitism centre that would actually be a centre for the study of contemporary anti semitism Okay, so speaking of the IRA definition, it comes basically to the, to the core question of or the struggle, the core struggle of defining anti so, and um, maybe, Mark, could you say something to the German debate about defining anti-Semitism? Because there was, so I guess, the, your initiative, um, you're using the IRA definition, and for example, Riga's Institute in Aachen is using IRA as well, but the Center for Anti-Semitism was in Berlin, the leader of it, um, she refused to use her, she had a criticism and she was more on the side of the Jerusalem Declaration. So, do you have any points or any remarks? <coughs> yeah, but I believe the situation is a bit different than in, in the UK. There are people who support the IO definition. Um, only if it doesn't you know, work with the IO definition because it's not really. Uh, a scholarly defi definition for research and it's a definition for, for practice context. Um, but obviously, it's the best one, um, the best one out there at the moment. And um, that is itself uh, something that a lot of critics uh, really just um, either underestimate or just purposely uh, neglect. And that it was an incredible effort to bring all these countries together to agree on a definition of anti Semitism that in itself is. Uh, it was a, a historic step, and, and then to just criticize that and to uh, 
uh, propose a different version of the Jerusalem Declaration, which is uh, just worse uh, than the other definition, and just, um, you know, for example, says that um, he's only anti Semitic if, if Jews are criticized as Jews, which basically kind of excludes all, all forms of camouflage anti Semitism that is not open anti Semitism. So it, it, it's a huge step, step backwards, I think. Uh, and yeah, the fact that Stefan Schüler Spring Robo, the guy of the Zentrum for Antisemitismus Forschung, has endorsed it, is quite telling. Nonetheless, I would also like to say that there are a lot of uh, really uh, promising scholars at the ZFI in Berlin. There are a lot of students, and especially PhD students, who are really doing really good stuff. And who are, um, we've talked to quite a number of them, and they're so unhappy with the situation with the leadership there. And so maybe this is also the generation that will uh, you know, critique the leadership for this kind of uh, supporting the JDA, for example. Um, I, I, can, uh, I wouldn't attempt to quantify the support for both definitions in the general context. Um, uh, I think there is, uh, there is. That is, I think, really the difference in the, the, uh, the British context. There are quite a lot of institutions and people who are um, calling out that attack on the other definition as a political attack on it and uh, a way to try to legitimize certain forms of anti Semitism, especially um, hostility to Israel, and tries to disconnect that from anti Semitism. Um, from what I gathered from David, that is, there's no way that uh, that kind of critique in the, in the British context. Um, in Germany, there are people speaking out, um, but again, it's hard to quantify support for other um, But the fact that there is support in these important institutions is it, a problem. Um, but we'll see how that, how that goes on with that debate. Um, Um, so I have an, another question about the IRA, uh, as we're talking about it right now. Um, David, you mentioned uh, it being quite tame, really. I was wondering, uh, I'll ask the two of you, uh, but would you consider them the reasons uh, people get so furious about the IRA when it's so tame? What's happening? <laughs> I think I've kind of already uh, given an answer to that, um, uh, because the one thing that Ira does, and it doesn't do much, but the mm -hmm. one thing that it does is to say anti-Semitism of this kind, and to Zionist anti-Semitism is real and is significant, and it looks like this generally, but be careful. That's what it says. And the people who don't like it don't like that. They don't like people who say, that anti-Zionist and are significant because they are anti-Zionists and because they uh, often do things that kind of look like some of the examples. That's very simple. Uh, the, a couple of words on the Jerusalem Declaration. Firstly, I strenuously object to the name. Right? <laughs> the name of the Jerusalem Declaration is, is an attempt to mobilize some kind of Jewish identity of some of the people who have written it as a, 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 a way of giving it authority or, or legitimacy. It's not the Jerusalem deck. It's got nothing to do with Jerusalem. <laughs> right? It wasn't, you know, it's, it's like complete nonsense that it's called the Jerusalem Declaration. But it's, it's uh, a, a kind of as a Jew thing. It's like, like generally when people talk about identity politics, they're drawing attention to their own experience of uh, what it's like uh, to be a woman who experiences sexism, or what it's like to be a black person who experiences racism. But when anti-Zionist Jews mobilize the legitimacy of identity politics, what they're doing is they're using it to kind of give evidence against the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community. It's a kind of extraordinary inversion of identity politics. So firstly, don't call it the Jerusalem Declaration. I don't know, 
you know, it was, uh, I, I'm not familiar enough with the people who wrote it to know exactly where it was conceived, but it, but the, the name Jerusalem does something which it, it should not be allowed to start, actually. And what does it do? What does the document do? The document takes the key elements of rhetoric of this kind of contemporary anti-Semitism. Boycotts, BDS, academic boycotts, uh, uh, um, disproportional and uh, uh, emotional uh, criticism of Israel and rhetoric, uh, the analogies with Nazism, with apartheid, with colonialism. It takes each element of rhetoric which is central to contemporary anti-Semitism as it exists in the complex social world and it takes them out of the social world, world and it says, inside the privacy of my own head, of my own professorial head, I can conceive of a BDS which is not anti-Semitic. Therefore, BDS in and of itself is not anti-Semitic. Therefore, the apartheid analogy, because I, in, in the privacy of my own head, can conceive of an apartheid analogy that is not anti-Semitic, it's not as men, etc., etc. So what it does is it takes the elements of rhetoric that in the real world actually constitute the key elements of anti-Semitism and it abstracts them and says in and of itself it's not as men. Uh, of course nothing in the social world appears in and of itself. Nothing, right? Everything appears in, con in a social context. So to tell me that BDS in and of itself is not anti-Semitic is to tell me nothing. I want to know what BDS does in the real world when it is an element of rhetoric that circulates between democratic spaces and undemocratic spaces, when it comes from uh, all sorts of uh, uh, heritages, for example, from the Soviet Union, from the Arab boycott, from uh, uh, the... Um, uh, um, Iranian regime, from all sorts of places and also from democratic spaces. So don't tell me that in and of itself it might not be anti-Semitic. Tell me what it really is in the real world and there's only one way you can find out which is to do research, right? to do social research and look at how these elements of rhetoric really operate in a social movement, in a trade union, in a Labour Party, in a government, in uh, uh, the you know University of California, find out, go and look. It's just kind of it tells you nothing. But in the head of some professor who imagines himself to be in Jerusalem, it's not anti-Semitic. I mean, it's hard to speculate on intentions. To come look at people's heads. Um, um, what I can judge is what I, what I see is some people supporting these attempts and other people are not. Um, maybe I'm a bit naive, but I've, I've, my intuition is that sometimes there will be people, who are, for example, um, signing these long public letters of support for the Jerusalem Declaration or criticism, criticism of the Arab definition. I think a lot of the people really haven't read the Arab definition. Um, but we need to be concerned if, if there's a debate about it, don't know what it actually says. Maybe they, they don't want to know what it says because they already have an opinion. That's a problem in itself. Um, but my maybe naive hope is that at least among these people, if they actually would engage with it, it might change their opinions. Um, but yeah, it's hard, it's hard to uh, look at people's heads. And maybe, maybe it's just a small minority of people who are really not who have these networks who are saying, look, uh, who are sending these public letters to all their friends and say, look, I wrote this down, <laughs> sign it, and give it to legitimacy. And I think that is what happened. That's what happened a lot of the time. Um, so probably not all of these people are anti civilites but they are legitimizing anti civilities and that is, that is bad enough. Um, um, but maybe, maybe, maybe the hope is there that um, some people might, might change their, their opinions. That are actually engaging in what's uh, what the RSS. What about questions from us? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one last question from my side, and then we'll get to one more. 
Um, so, just short question to you guys, to both of you. So, you're teaching at the university for years, and you're just starting to have your initiative, um, but you already had three conferences, right? So that's quite a lot. How do you, would you describe the interests of students for the study of fantasy? Is there like a real interest? Um, I mean, your conferences, there was live stream as well, so there were people watching live, there were people there. Your conference in London was pretty successful. Uh, I mean, it was there, and really a lot of people there speaking, but also listening to the talks. So it seemed to be as a, quite a success. So, would you, how would you describe the interest of students? Um, oh. <laughs> well, it, I mean, that's a very difficult question, and the atmosphere uh, for students is also hostile. There is, of course, a, there are of course a lot of students who want to understand what's going on, but there are many, many students who just as, sort of assimilate to the ordinary opinions, which are that uh, uh, Jews are white, and uh, basically uh, nearly all of them are pro-imperialist, and uh, Israel is a keystone in the whole global system of capitalism, imperialism, and uh, modernity, and um, that. Uh, Israel is symbolic of everything that they find abhorrent. Um, so, look, you know, every now and then a student at my college gets in touch with me, kind of quietly, and says, I talk to you. <laughs> and tells me just awful stories about what's happened to them. Uh, and uh, it's quite moving. Really. Um, so, there are certainly students who want to learn and who want to think and who want to study. And actually, in the big world out there, um, anti-Semitism isn't a particularly mainstream business. Like there are other threatening discourses in the world out there, which which are really significant and much more kind of widespread. Anti-Semitism is very often, especially the kind that we're talking about, is much more an elite phenomenon. It's uh, Hannah Arendt talked about the, 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 the totalitarianism being a kind of unity between the elite and the mob, she said. And often I've had the feeling that there's an elite kind of searching for its mob, but actually there are bigger and more threatening mobs out there. Um, uh, uh, so, um, <laughs> uh, so, from our experience is that there's rarely this kind of highly Ideologized those students who really comes to class and already uh, thinks that they know everything about the, the movie, uh, the Israeli Palestinian uh, conflict, or about anti Semitism, or anti This doesn't really happen too much, I think, at least in Korea. It doesn't. Um, of course, there are these kind of groups, but I think maybe that's more of a problem in Berlin or in I suppose, in Korea. Um, what we observe a rather a lot of well, First of all, they don't really know anything about that. They, they say they don't know anything about anti-Semitism or about the israel palestinian conflict, but not really want to know. Um, and maybe this is part of the specific German post-national socialist um, context. People know that this is German history and they kind of want to learn. Um, you know, obviously in school you learn about the Holocaust, but you don't really uh, at least that was, that's my experience in school. You don't, you don't go out of the class and then you know what anti Semitism is. You don't actually know anything about anti Semitism. You should be out of the class of classes. That's a problem. People want to learn. They know that's what they're, they're looking for the time. And they're open to, uh, at least in my experiences, they're quite open to, uh, to learn. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone uh, wants to go in depth and research anti Semitism or read uh, you know, 10 academic articles and five monographs. Um, but people want to get a general idea of what it is. And that's what we've been observing. And another thing is that we often we do these conferences, for example, there are some students watching that or taking part in that. 
but what we're also trying to do is reach for a broader audience that is also not, not necessarily an academic audience. Uh, especially we try to go beyond that. We have uh, the culture of anti-Semitism, the cultural means against anti-Semitism this year for the first time. We've reached all sorts of students, people still in, in school. Um, we've reached character, their parents, um, all sorts of people who usually don't get into contact with that. And, and that's also what we're trying to do. And there's also a lot of openness. Um, and what's interesting there, which what you noticed, or at least what I noticed, um, we had a, a theater play, which we, uh, which we did, and it was about the memory culture. And one of the, uh, and it was a humorous attempt at kind of uh, a satire of, human, of German memory culture. And what I noticed was that between the older generations, very reserved, they didn't even allow themselves to laugh at obvious jokes. But the younger people really, they laughed. When there was really you know, a typical political speech which says nothing. Uh, it is the whole, you know, we have to protect democracy and all that kind of stuff, this typical speech. And the younger generation really noticed that it's hilarious, that it's not what's, what's actually, what should be done here. That is uh, so out of, out of touch. With what should what should be done, um, and then they, they realize that they laugh at it. And the older generation really, really was still quite reserved and didn't allow themselves to do that. Um, and so I always have that hope that there is a new generation also in, in classes every year at university who are come to university, who come to university or come to these events and really are, don't really have an opinion yet uh, and want to learn a lot of them. These are basics. Maybe I'm naive, but I'm always a bit optimistic. So um, I'm going to skip my question and, and go over the mic to the audience and ask one question. Um, so um, I want to switch to the thought of emancipation um, because I really wonder, and that's something I'm really thinking of at the moment, is how far Jews actually de facto because of Jewry we are, and that would be also a question relating to Great Britain, how far Jews are actually emancipated in the academia and the cultural scene. Um, because from my experiences, what I learn and uh, I'm sorry maybe this is a bit um, harsh but also even in anti-semitism studies <laughs> many people don't are not really in contact with Jews that live in Germany actually live in Germany are not probably part of the academia just go after their normal lives because um, we're still a very young community here in Germany I'd say after the Shoah and um, and we're, we're not as far yet, probably, to say so. And um, I wonder how, how much, because that was a discussion I had with my theater professor, actually. I told him, listen, I think the two of us are living in German worlds, and I cannot even, um, like, to, like, be too angry about it, because I have a feeling we don't know a lot about Jews that are actually alive and living here. Because in Germany, even from my feeling, there's a lot of sentiment about the Jews. And uh, when Jews are heard, and that's actually the second part, is where I am, and that's a part, part where things are accepted to stay, unfortunately, is in the arts and theater and culture. And um, there, it's a very international subject, and uh, especially the independent theaters. Um, I, I really felt like, okay, David, I know what you're talking about with that um, declaration, because we had a similar declaration in the theatre scene, um, which was called GG 5.3 Welt Offenheit, where all the major independent theatres and cultural institutions were going out and declaring something like in favour of BDS, one would say. 
And no one said anything against it. And they did it on Hanukkah, on the first night of Hanukkah, which was betraying the Jewish people in a way. <laughs> and, um, and when they talked to Jews, it's mainly Jews from the US or Jews from Israel, and they, they barely get in touch with Jews who are actually leading their lives here. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a big problem um, in, in my perspective, and that's maybe also something I don't know if Jews here are actually also um, in contact with anti-Semitism research that much. That would be also another question um, I would ask. And um, and I was giving a talk on a on a stage as a Jewish person relating to anti-Semitism in theater. And the first question I was asked about was Rothbard and um, and being white. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Where, where this is also a very interesting fact in Germany because uh, Germany, having its focus on, on post colonialism, is also a part of. We are not a part of a whole community of Europeans who did bad things, not only us, the Schwab. So, yeah, I talked about it, I'm sorry. <laughs> hmm. Should we let other people speak? Uh, Maybe because we've spoken a lot already, or should I answer first? come back on that? <laughs> uh, we can collect a uh, couple of questions if you like. Uh, actually, it depends on the to the moderators. I'm not the moderators. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, my question is actually a bit related to what Kara asked. Um, it's because I'm always that, I don't know, that really puzzled about this. For example, if you're doing anti Semitism research for 20 or 30 years in Germany and you still, I don't know, um, see it as a, like of, a kind of a, a historical phenomenon um, and not a present one, and you don't. Um, connect the things from your historical research to, for example, for challenges for daily Jewish life in Germany or worldwide. So, um, and I really, I, I know you talked about the my person um, principle, and we can talk about why in some kind of progressive theories maybe Jews are not considered as this subaltern individuals or something like that, and there are a lot of I don't know, um, uh, thinking about what the postmodern approach um, does in this kind of ignoring modern anti Semitism, or is it more about, like, for example, the ZFR or other research institutes? There are a lot of um, researchers or professors from the uh, 68 er generation who are, I don't know, um, they are anti Semitism researchers focused on national socialism um, and uh, fascism and not really connected with uh, modern anti-Semitism. But I'm, I'm always really puzzled how you can research this topic and still do not get what anti-Semitism is or what, what it mean, means now. So I don't know if you have some answers about these kind of, like you, uh, you call the parallel words. Because they really this big field of research, but it's not really connected to um, yeah daily anti-Semitism on German streets or um, case streets. Um, I'll say we collect one more question and then we get for the answers of our guests. Uh, one question, do you have any? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jutta. Um, I think the assumption to think you just have to enlighten people um, and then they get rid of their anti Semitism prejudices is really naive. Uh, because you have to think about in which society they are living. That parents, grandparents, grandparents are, a lot of them have been murderers or have been assisting murders. 
an assassination of Jews, and this is deeply founded in the psyche and the conscience of the people here. That means not knowing what anti-Semitism is, is real talk. If you live in the society, being educated by your family, by school, and do not know what anti-Semitism is, <laughs> that's, that's not a neutral um, explanation. That's a kind of a decision of a special... I'm not just what I have been ill until yesterday, so I have lost some English in the last week. So. Um, but you know what I wanted to say, that um, I think if you do not put this whole issue as complex as it is, not only is it, you have, of course you have to organize within sciences, of course you have to network, but don't put your careers on this idea. You have to research if you're really interested. And if the situation will get worse in the next years, yet you might have to split your career thinking of uh, your fighting against anti-Semitism. That means you have to look out into society. You, may, you have to make this all public. You have to find people. Look, this is an academic area. If you really want to, get out of this nice rooms, fantastic microphone, as David says. You have to look for um, allies in society and get out on the street and not hide in universities with so complex ground floors, not even you find the right doors. For me, I really have never tried to today. It was a bit problematic. So, if it's the other people who are interested, I would never find this place. That means go out, make it, how we say, niedrig uh, Okay, okay. Make it easy to reach. Um, so and and bring it in the proper. We are just preparing um, a conference or um, an event about the BDS because of this Roger Waters event in <laughs> Hessen next. Year. And the debate is running. Oh, is, he's making such a few. Look, Pink Floyd, and great music, and all this bullshit. And the debate about the BDS is going from zero again. Every year from zero again. So, I propose that as a result of this debate, and especially of David Hirsch's books and his speech here, we should get the idea of organized and everybody who is interested in Shelter make contact um, with me um, and organize with a kind of alliance an um, event in Frankfurt against the BDS, but outside of university and in any, in any house which is in the center of the city. So, and then a real political debate, not too soft, not too smooth, not too careful, not too shy, so a little bit more provocation would, would help enlightenment. Okay, um, emancipation. <coughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, I suspect, I don't know, I think emancipation isn't really about democracy, right? It's about having ordinary democratic rights. Uh, to vote and rights to be the government and rights to be accepted under the rule of law. That's not the problem, I think. I, and I also think that there was a certain kind of anti-Semitism that, that resulted from emancipation, that resulted from Jews becoming ordinary, mainstream uh, human beings. It, that, I'm just arguing about the word, I, I don't know it's the right word. I think it's true that Jews are, in a sense, very emancipated in social life, in all kinds of, of, of areas of life, but they kind of know they have to keep quiet about this, right? Uh, and, I mean, I always used to say that Jews have, have a kind of choice, right? They can either stay quiet, keep their heads down, and generally they'll be okay, 
or they can join with the anti-Zionists and denounce uh, Jewish uh, racism, or they can uh, engage with it critically and seriously. And uh, the problem with keeping your heads down is that it, it, it becomes more and more difficult, actually. Um, I mean, there are other problems, but that's one of them. So, for example, on my campus, uh, uh, if you were a Jewish student who kept your head down and actually you like to play rugby, rather than going to political or, or, or academic lectures, fine. But suddenly the students' union said that they're going to put a patch, of, a BDS patch, on the rugby shirt of the university. And then suddenly you're keeping your head down, minding your own business, playing rugby, and suddenly you then have to either mind your own business and carry around a BDS patch on your shirt, or then you have to get involved. So keeping your head down is difficult. Um, the other two options are, well, difficult too. Um, I think, I don't know, I mean, look, I don't know the, the, the Jewish community in Germany very well. Um, I think in some senses people have said that the Jewish community in Britain was a kind of model, that it did, there was a really big, serious, solid consensus at the time of Jeremy Corbyn. And in a sense, maybe uh, uh, people, I know people go to America and say that the American Jewish community should be a little more united along those lines. I don't know. Um, there's an interesting thing that I notice is that quite often people who take contemporary anti-Semitism very seriously and who notice it and who understand it are a little marginal even in the Jewish community. That I see people who, who are kind of, you know, inside the Jewish community and they go to shul every week and every holiday and they, are, they have kind of made a decision to uh, uh, participate in Jewish life in that sense. But in a sense it's, it's those of us who didn't do that, who found ourselves in sociology departments, who were really confronted with anti-Semitism, but also who were in a position where they could uh, uh, really think it through and, and really perhaps come back to the Jewish community and say, this is what's going on out here. And there is some resistance. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't know Jewish uh, holy um, texts very well, but I noticed that some of the uh, most interesting characters in the Jewish holy texts also went outside of the community. Uh, Moses, for example, and Joseph, for example, went outside and lived their life outside, which put them in a position to understand the outside world with some clarity uh, to enable them to kind of provide some leadership. And I, I mean, I, you know, I think that's kind of interesting, that kind of perspective. Um, I think that it's astonishing that, you know, the Holocaust scholars, scholars of the Holocaust, people who studied the Holocaust for 30 years and then who signed, you know, the Jerusalem Declaration without any understanding of the contemporary debates that they're intervening in, uh, is, a, is a very unsettling business. Um, and see, here's one of the interesting things is that, that uh, People used to say, I heard somebody say that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is very, is really good on, on, on sort of home policy and he's really good against every racism except for anti-Semitism where he has a blind spot. And the problem with anti-Semitism is that it's symbolic of everything. And if you embrace anti-Semitism, it's generally a kind of indicator that you've got everything wrong. And it's really quite upsetting to think that some of the Holocaust scholars might have got everything wrong. <laughs> And one of the things that sometimes you kind of feel in Holocaust scholarship is a failure to understand the, the attraction to so many people of National Socialism. That it was radical and it was exciting and it was sexy and they had, you know, Hugo Boss uniforms and, and they were counter-hegemonic. They said that this ordinary, stupid, everyday life is, is, is crap and they imagine some, you know, radical critique. And it seems to me that 
that's one of the really unsettling things that people still have trouble with when they think about 20th century totalitarianism is that they can't remember or they can't conceive how people like them might have got excited about it. And we see that with, and then there's a kind of prohibition, right? Oh no, you mustn't talk about the Holocaust in relation to this or to that or to the other, because the Holocaust is holy, right? And, and you mustn't compare this or that to the Holocaust. And what that does is it makes the Holocaust something outside of history and outside of human society. And it wasn't, it was very, very human. And it was very, very much related to radical critique. And academia, of course, is very keen on radical critique. And when radical critique becomes content, when, when it's not critique anymore, but when it begins to say everything that exists is shit, is trash, and it needs to be torn down, and we need to start again, which is not a critique. <laughs> it's not, oh, look, some things don't work as well as they might, and other things are, are really have a structural problem. Uh, um, and when we see mirrors of, you know, embryonic pieces of totalitarian politics happening today, when we see conspiracy fantasy, when we see people talking about, uh, uh, you know, the elites in the cities, the cosmopolitans, the globalists, the Zionists, the imperialists, the privileged, the... Uh, um, Finance capital, which is kind of evil, whereas productive capital is much more masculine and kind of uh, uh, mus muscly, and, and all of these kinds of things that that people do not recognise at all as being hostile. And so, um, in a way, we need to kind of stop the whole thing being so holy, because because then the only response is blasphemy. We have to think of it in much more kind of rational terms about how this can happen and how it's exciting and how it's attractive and how this can happen in a, in a civilized society. And just to finish, I think uh, uh, um, the world is not as comfortable as it looked 40 or 50 years ago, right? And we do have the rise of populist politics and it's not over, it's not finished. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Trump coming back. We see who's in government in Italy. We see um, what's happening in uh, Hungary and in Poland. We see a state being overrun by a totalitarian regime in the middle of Europe as we speak, and we see other states failing to go to its aid. And uh, um, we see Europe kind of breaking apart, at least the British doing their best to make that happen. And um, the, we see the cost of living crisis, and we see inflation, and we see, uh, and we don't see people offering rational political responses. In fact, some of the kinds of issues that we're faced with almost sort of belie rational political responses. How do you deal with climate change? Uh, uh, it's kind of such a huge issue. So. <laughs> So, things are not going to be good. I mean, look, they might be good and I might be uh, hysterical and I really hope that's true and <laughs> it's my job to worry and I'll do that, right? But um, I don't think I'm being too silly. Really. Yeah, that's because I need to just a few things I want to touch on because they could really outside most of the things that I have said. Um, with regard to the first question, um, I don't really want to comment on the state of emancipation of Jewish people in Germany because I'm not Jewish and I can judge that. And what I want to say is that there's a lack of contact between anti Semitism and research, researchers of Jewish people in Germany. I think that is, that is definitely true, unfortunately. Um, that's what we're trying to do differently. We're always trying to stay in contact with the um, Jewish community, for example, uh, in Korea. Um, uh, other uh, Jewish groups. That's part of our idea. Um, to not do that just abstractly in academia, uh, in university, and, and lose touch. Um, but the part of the point uh, of the, the Holocaust, uh, 
you know, people researching in the open source world for general for, you know, for years on end and they just not uh, even understanding what anti Semitism is. I also think that is puzzling. Um, I also think it's quite telling that you know, in Germany we have one research center on anti Semitism, but we have uh, we have really quite a lot of research centers on the Holocaust. A uh, good number of projects on the Holocaust, which was uh, absolutely right. Um, but that this discrepancy is quite telling, you know. Uh, the German mainstream society likes to deal with dead Jews, likes to look at Jews who were murdered, likes to look at how Jews were murdered, but doesn't care about actual Jews living here nowadays. Uh, now it's quite telling. Um, yeah, to Jutta's point, I wasn't trying to suggest that we can invite an anti Semites. Of course, that doesn't work. Um, I think there's some people who are not yet anti Semites. Um, maybe you can reach them, but obviously, if that's your whole world, you can't just uh, tell them the facts and then change their mind. That's how that works. I know that. Um, and your point to try to find allies in civil society, that's also what we're trying to do. Um, all the time, and that's what we do with the culture groups against anti Semitism. We do a culture festival against anti Semitism, Trina. Um, and we had it this year for the first time, and we're trying to do that every year. Um, also, kind of as maybe a small <coughs> counterpoint to uh, the documenters of the world, um, where you know, anti Semitism in the culture industry is really uh, obvious, and we're trying to do different because there are obviously. People in the culture and the arts that are critical of anti Semitism and want to give these people space. Um, yeah, that's a, I think a commented to more questions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you to you for answering that. Do we have uh, more questions from the audience? <coughs> Okay, we already have uh, half past uh, eight, so I would like then to thank uh, you for joining here uh, for tonight. I would like to thank David and Mark uh, for making this podium uh, really happen tonight. And uh, so uh, thank you everybody for joining and uh, for being here and uh, listening. Uh, um, we are going to have a soon maybe for a, for a drink or something to eat, so everybody's welcome to join us there also if you like uh, to continue the conversation. Um, I have a closing remark uh, uh, um, about, um, about the network of young academics against anti Semitism, which we actually continue and in our friend. Founded in the aftermath of uh, the London Conference uh, from David in the London Centre uh, in September. So, um, if you're working academically on anti Semitism, uh, we have the idea that uh, we want also like the, like the Centre in Birmingham or the London Centre, uh, early career researchers uh, want to get together to exchange our ideas in a Safe uh, environment where we can really discuss uh, things with each other and uh, want to strengthen our positions in academia and amplify our voices. So, if you uh, are interested in, in that, uh, please uh, come talk to me at Tim then and uh, we set up a meeting at uh, the end of November and probably. Going for online seminar in spring next year. And we can manage it, secure the funds which we all need. Uh, we hope for a conference here in front of uh, next uh, autumn next year. So that would be a nice vision for the future. And thank you also for, for my side. And I might just make advertisement for your book. Uh, which you can buy, I guess, or uh, yeah. So um, and also David has two two more books or one more book for for sale. So uh, yeah, just got in touch with David or Mark. And uh, thank you, Alex tonight. And yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> so yeah.